All right. Uh, so we are now good to go. So good evening, everybody. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Fine. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, good, considering the circumstances. I had a uh, long debate with myself on if we were going to stick with the regular program material of the Bible study or deviate because of the happenings in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, so we're going to stick with our normal, our normal uh, programming, even though I'm wearing my I can't breathe shirt. Uh, so that everybody who sees me will, uh, you know, they know where I stand. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, uh, and part of it too was in my preparation for tonight, uh, there were some scriptures that, that I was reading and uh, it'll come out in Bible study of uh, tonight of why I decided to, to really go ahead and stick with, um, stick with uh, our, our regular uh, program material. So does anybody want to uh, lead us off in prayer? I will. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you for letting us gather together again this, um, this evening for Bible study. Let everything be said and heard. Hopefully we can apply to our lives. Bless everyone on the study and hopefully more will join us. Pray for our country, all this coronavirus stuff and our president. I just ask you to be with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us another day. And just thank you, Lord. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week uh, we were in uh, Daniel chapter three, and uh, that particular portion of Daniel dealt specifically with the fiery furnace. Uh, something that stands out in that is the fact that we're only dealing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel is not in this at all. Uh, we also referenced uh, Isaiah 43, 2, where uh, God tells us, or Isaiah tells us the word of God, that when we go through the, wa the river, we will not be overtaken, that when we walk through the fire, we'll not be burned, uh, which was true for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that everybody around them perished. Uh, but when they emerged, from the fiery furnace, not only did they were they able to walk out, uh, but the word said they weren't even, there was no evidence of fire or even smelled like smoke. Uh, we were looking at also the, the idea that the whole reason why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were even in the situation they were in was because of the, the jealousy of the people, the other magicians who were previously in chapter two had their lives saved by Daniel and these three men uh, who are now jealous of them because of the position that they had been elevated to by God. Uh, but even in, in within that, you don't see anything about repercussions or revenge on their part. Uh, but the fact that uh, they were faithful and remained true to God, and even through their example at the very end, we see that Nebuchadnezzar ended up praying and honoring God and threatening everybody else who even spoke ill of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that leads us to where we are starting today in chapter four. Uh, let me get that queued up for us here. Uh, moving this to my other screen so I can share it and still see what's going on. So, um, we are going to uh, Daniel chapter four, and it should be popping up on your screen any second. Did everybody see it? All yes. right, okay. So uh, someone please uh, go ahead and, and do a little reading for us. To all people, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth, 
peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the sign and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Okay, let's let's stop there real quick. Now, um, as I ended last week, it was with the direction that everybody pre pre or read chap chapter four if you had have never done it before. Uh, let let's take a honest survey. Did everybody read? Not guilty. No. Nope. I mean guilty. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the uh, because I, I would know that if um, someone had, had read it, there would probably be some questions right off the bat. So we're going to deal with that right now. The what we see here in, in literary terms is what you call a prolipsis, which is you the beginning, the end of the story is the beginning of the story. Uh, th there's a movie called The Usual Suspects, which is one of my favorite films. And the movie opens up with the closing scene, uh, or it's not the complete closing scene, but near the very end of the movie is what opens the film. And, and it's the whole setup is to give you a glimpse of to what's coming uh, in the end, that it is not to give, a, give anything away. It is just simply to give you an idea that this is where we're going. And in this particular case, this particular story is written in that same format. We have, as it starts off with Nebuchadnezzar, to all the peoples, he's telling a story. And as we move past these first three verses, once we get in to uh, verse four, now we're going to see uh, what the actual beginning of the story. It, and, and you notice, what is the what do we see in verse two that stands out? Just read it. It, it should tell you what's what stands out. Signs and wonders. And not just signs and wonders, it's the fact that he says his words. I thought it good to declare. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan. Remember, he, he is the one that, that uh, ravaged and, and, and destroyed Jerusalem and took away all the elements of the temple and put them into the, the temples of his gods. And so he is a pagan who paid no attention to God, didn't believe in God and didn't worship God. And he starts out, first of all, acknowledging everybody that's there to all the peoples, nations, languages that dwell on this earth. And he's, he's declaring peace. This is a wartime king, the most powerful man in the world, and he is first off declaring peace to everybody that's within his realm, and then he goes right into, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders the Most High God has worked for me. He's given a testimony of God and what God has done for him. And then in verse 3, he, he breaks it down. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. This right off the first three uh, verses of this story, this chapter, he is just going in 100 on, on the goodness of God. Now, the, you, you guys know you've been with me for a little while and you, really, and you probably have the, the my, well, you should know how I'm going to proceed with this. If a pagan who has never been, uh, never knew who God was until he came into contact with Daniel, uh, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah, how is it that this pagan that can recognize the goodness of God and we who have been raised in the church our entire lives that have known people who are Christians can't give a simple testimony to one person. Crickets. <laughs> Repeat that. Uh, let's see it. How, how is it that a pagan uh -huh. in the form of Nebuchadnezzar can mm -hmm. speak so highly of the God that we know he doesn't, he doesn't remember this. Is, he wasn't raised as, as a Jew. 
person. They were dealing with, with the Hebrew Jew, the ancient Israelites during this time. He wasn't raised as an Israelite. He was raised as, as a Babylonian. He was a pagan. He knew nothing of the God of Israel, except for the fact he knew that the temple that Solomon built had all this stuff that was fine and, and, and valuable, and he took it all. That's why he took it. Now, how is it that this man, this pagan man who, who despised our God, is now singing the praises and the wonders of a God we serve and believe, but yet Christians who have known him their whole lives won't say an utter word about the goodness of God? How? I don't know. How? That's that's a question. No, that's the a answer. question. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, you know, when you think about this, it, you know, because we all have a testimony. Now, there are some who are going to have a greater testimony. And then there are some that is going to have a testimony that may not be as great by somebody else's standard. But the fact of the matter is, we have all experienced something that God has brought us through. We have seen God work in our lives. And yet, there is no testimony. Can anybody actually say they have never had a test that God didn't help them through? No. I can't, no, I can't say that. But I, I, may, I may confess it to say, or uh, testify to say uh, you or Gwen or, you know, just on a personal level, I may not necessarily testify in front of a lot of people mm -hmm. but see here's the thing the testimony to me doesn't mean anything because we we're on the same page the testimony is supposed to be for the people who don't know see that the, see nebuchadnezzar says to all peoples nations and languages that dwell all uh, in all the earth he, he's naming these people who don't know anything about God. So this, let me slow down. I'm not chastising you. Keep this in your mind that when you are being brought through something that God has given you a, a level of peace in the middle of a storm that you never thought would happen. If you have seen him a miraculous sign in your life, then you need to be telling somebody and the people that somebody you should be telling is not me but someone who does not know God and the pardoning of their sins. Because that's where the testimony gains traction. That's where the testimony becomes powerful because, oh, or it could be me if you know I'm just up here playing around and I have no testimony. If I don't have any testimony and I'm going to church because we got plenty of these folks that, that sit up and play church but don't have a testimony. Now, if, if I'm that person, no, you share that with me. But if you know that I got a testimony, then it's not that I don't want to hear it. The value is not in me. The value will come from when someone who has no knowledge of God, because people will invariably tell you, atheists, what has God done for you? Why should I follow your God? See, that's not a question I have, but that's a question they will have. That's the question the pagans have, which is why Nebuchadnezzar is te directing this to all the people, not just to the Israelites. He's not even dealing with the Israelites because they knew the God of Abraham and Isaac. He's telling this to the people who do not know this God. I am about to tell you about somebody who has all power. As he said, he has how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. He's saying everything he has is everything is in God's hands and it is going to last forever. And he's telling this to the world. So remember, this is the prolipsis. This is to be the end of the story. He's, he's getting ready to, he's telling us, he's at the end claiming the victory of God, now he's getting ready to tell us the story. So let's have somebody else besides Gwen pick up at chapter four, I mean at verse four. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. Uh, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop right there. I'm sorry. I should have just said read verse four alone. Read verse four over, please. Just verse four. Just verse four. 
Mm-hmm. Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I right. saw a dream. No, 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 made just me stop, a- no, stop right there. That was it. I never okay. was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. So he, he set in the tone here, you know, this before he, he even knows who God is. He, now he's given us how great God is, but now he's going back to the beginning and he's getting ready to tell us everything. And here he's saying, I'm at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. This is exactly everybody we know. You at home, you minding your own business, whether it's COVID shelter in place or whether everything is, is what it was a year ago. Everybody is fine. And everybody's life and their mind is always good until the storm hits. And here he says, I'm at rest in my house and I'm flourishing in my palace. This, this is the kind of thing, the, the mindset that we, we have that we don't need God because I'm flourishing where I am. It, a conversation I had with my dad years ago, I had dropped out of college, I'm working at Federal Express, I'm on the fast track to becoming a managing director, and my dad asked me the question, Ronald, when are you going back to school to get your degree? And my response was, could have been just like Nebuchadnezzar, I'm resting my house and flourishing in my palace. I'm on the fast track to becoming a managing director without a degree. What do I need a degree for? Which is the same thing a response we'll get from people. I don't need God. Look at all this stuff I got. I got the good job, the good spouse, you know, great husband and wife, big house, beautiful kids, car in the driveway, money in the bank, residual income coming in from the property I own. I'm flourishing. What do I need this? Don't talk to me about this guy. Dude, you see where I'm going? Is he where he was and, and where we are as people, even the people who claim to know God still play this game of, you know, I'll play church, but I'm flourishing where I am. So I really don't have to give this much to God because I got all I need and all I want. Some of us have even said that ourselves. I don't need this stuff because I got it. I got it. I, I, what do I need God for? As if the only thing we need God for is to make sure we have the pleasures of life, right? Right. Hmm. Uh, Lisa, go on and, uh, with verse five, please. I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of, of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of my dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the shalogens, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is, how you pronounce that? Belteshazzar. Bet, oh, I like that. Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God in him, is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secrets trouble you. Explain to me the vision of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. Okay, stop right there. So, here he is. Uh, having another dream. I mean, isn't that what we saw in chapter two? He had a dream. Yes. Yes. He, what What's different with this ver- uh, This dream compared to the last one? If you can think, remember off the top of your head, and if you don't, it's okay. Um, so he was afraid. He couldn't sleep here either. In the interest of time, I'll just tell you. The, the difference between the two is the first time he would not reveal the dream to anybody. In oh. this case, he revealed the dream. It, I mean, it's almost Wait, like- say it again, Ronald. He, in, in Ronald, chapter say it, two, repeat it, please. In chapter two, when he had the dream, a dream that kept him up at night, he would not reveal the dream to, the, to his magicians. When they asked him, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. And he said, no, 
you're you're the smart guy you tell me what my dream was and then you interpret it that was the reason why daniel was elevated to the position he was because he when the when the man came to kill them he asked for a day and he went in with hananiah mishael and azariah and they prayed together and god revealed the dream and the interpretation here we are in chapter four and he says you know, after he brought all the, the, the wise men to him, I made known, uh, make known, uh, it's what he, let me read that exactly. Therefore, I issued a decree, issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they make known, make, make known to me the interpretation of the dream. See, he telling them the dream so they can interpret it. But he, I think he wasn't afraid to tell him this time because he knew that Daniel would be able to give him the interpretation. And the wise men couldn't give him an interpretation, even though they could have made one up, probably thought better to, instead of making up an a interpretation, because Daniel was then going to come and tell the correct interpretation of the dream, in which case then they would probably be put to death. Um, but when we read this and you see that he was, he says, I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Here he's having these nightmares again that he cannot sleep. He, it is, these dreams are so bad as keeping him up at wake, keeping him up at night. And he's got to seek these people. So he goes to the magicians to tell them the dream, but they couldn't make known the interpretation. Then he says in verse eight, but at last, Daniel came before me. Now he's calling him by his Hebrew name, but at last, and remember, he's telling the story to us. This is him telling the story now. Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. And he's making the distinction here that this is the name we gave him according to my religion and my culture. In him, is the spirit of the holy God. So he's recognizing and he's telling again that he is seeing there is something different about Daniel than anybody else he's dealt with in his region. And he said, and I told the dream before him saying, Belt, uh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you. The spirit of the holy God is in you. What do you think? And this is just free form. How do people recognize when the spirit of the holy God is in you? Because of your actions. Like what? Well, just on a daily basis and how you interact with people. And um, I think. Yeah, oh. how you handle how you handle sticky situations. Juju, what happening? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Pastor, I have I have a question on that verse that you just read. Go for it. Why is why is the God not capitalized when he says the spirit of the holy gods? It depends on which uh you're reading from the King James, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, it, this, this new King James version has it just slightly different. It doesn't say the spirit of the gods. It's just the holy God. Uh, but that ha that's probably a translation problem from the uh, ancient Hebrew to uh, what we have here. But um, keep in mind too, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan. Mm -hmm. believed in more than one God. You know, they, they, it was a polytheistic society, not a monotheistic, not a one God. So uh, it could be just simply him just still using his terms because that's the way he was, you know how it is when you get stuck doing something, this is my habit because of the way I was raised until you get to a place where the new thing takes over. So it, okay. I'm really not 100% certain. Uh, but it's when you see a little G, it is not God, Yahweh, Jehovah. Right. Little G's are just, you know, spirits or even when uh, when Creflo Dollar says that there's a God in you, 
uh, or that you are God. He's you, the little G God, not the big G God. Okay. So that is this, this section of scripture is the reason why I move forward with our normal teaching tonight instead of going with the angry uh, stuff where I was going to use the Bible as a weapon based on the actions today. Because this right here, Nebuchadnezzar said, and, uh, and I told a dream before him saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you. And we have to be aware as believers that regardless of the situation we're in, regardless of the situations where we are, regardless of what is happening around us, we have to remember the God that's in us. Now, that's not to say that you don't defend yourself. And that does not to say that you roll over and let people do whatever they want or you become a, a doormat for people to walk in and out of. It is just regarding how you respond. Because see, there are ways that we love to, to get as people. And see, remember what we're, what we're dealing with with Daniel and, and Hananiah, uh, 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 Azariah and Mishael, they are captives. They are not in their homeland. They are prisoners of war in another land. And God could have delivered them from that, but God has elevated them where they are. And there is a reason why they were elevated where they are. And we wonder sometimes why is it that we are not elevated where we are? And if we look closely at ourselves, and as, as I've said many times, when you look at your life through the mirror of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you really have to see yourself clearly for who you are. And do you have that quality? Does the reflection show that the spirit of the holy God is in you? Because it was in Daniel. And he says, so, go ahead. So I'm, I just want clarification. So you're saying that the way you know that the spirit of God is in someone is how they respond like to situations. Is that what you're saying? It's how you behave, how you respond, how you treat people. It's, it's your, it's actions. Thank you. As my wife clarified how your actions there, there is a way, see this, what the, I guess the point I want to make, I'm not talking about being a doormat or being a punk. What I'm saying is that there is a way to respond to situations to get the desired result that, or a result you desire that don't always resort to the street. Okay, can you give a real life example? Well, I mean, what's going on right now? You know, we got this, uh, this brother got, got it. Oh, God. That's horrible. I'm with you, Pastor. I'm with you. That's horrible. This man had his knee on his neck, mm -hmm. essentially collapsing his windpipe mm -hmm. with his hands in his pocket. Mm -mm. Now, I know I'm not the only one that wished you were within gunshot range to put a hot one in him. Now, right. somebody will tell me, Ronald, that's not very Christian. I'm not saying it's Christian to have that view. The human in me wants to respond that way in anger and rage. But we have to ask ourselves as believers in Christ, is this the way we want to be seen? Now, keep in mind, you read throughout <laughs> the whole Testament, the Old Testament, a lot of battles that were fought, a lot of blood that was shed on behalf of the God we serve. Mm -hmm. There is a time that God is going to call for bloodshed to occur. I'm not saying, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about that we're supposed to get out in the street and just start shooting folks. But in the absence of God directing us to take any kind of action, how we respond 
to those these things is how determines how people how we see each other now then to go like you'll have some people that will say uh oh here's a the incident in central park where the lady called the police saying that the the black man was threatening her life uh then of course after it gets all blown up and goes viral she apologizes and he accepts the apology um uh, people are pissed how do you accept that apology the same thing happened in dallas when botham jean was in his apartment and that cop walks in there and shoots him dead and the family said they forgive her people were upset mm -hmm. uh now did they really forgive her did this dude really forgive this woman i don't know I don't know if they just said it because that's they've been in church so long and that's what we do in church and we say we're supposed to forgive because God has forgiven us. But pastor, yes. With them saying that they forgive them, that didn't reveal the God in them to me. Well, that's that opinion. was that was exactly where I was getting ready to go is that by simply saying you forgive people is not revealing God in you those are just words. Right and they could they could have meaning or they cannot we don't know because we're we're not there observing these people but when we see uh when we this situation happened in minneapolis a just response at that time might have been people in, engaging to stop them from killing them he wasn't a threat to them. He's handcuffed on the ground. But the day after, and now the, the so-called protesting that was going on, they didn't destroy anything. But in the past, we have seen the anger and the rage turn into violence. That is not godly. You can have a demonstration and you can protest and you can do it peacefully and still be angry. But withholding that anger is probably is probably viewed as godly. Probably. Now I will also qualify this to say, I don't know. I'm just saying some things that could potentially be there because it doesn't do anything for the pain I feel inside. It doesn't do anything to quell the anger or the rage that I feel inside. Mm -hmm. But I do know that when I read that, and I read that he said, I know the spirit of the holy God is in you, it, made, it did shift something inside because I feel myself approaching a ledge and that all I need is a nudge to be on the other side. But reading that kept me from going over. Now, do we feel just open discussion? Is this man took his life, Mr. Floyd's life? Is it justice for us to then take his life? Yes. No. Let's see, I mean, but the reality of the situation is that's our rage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's our, our anger to say, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I'm being honest. That, no, you should be. I mean, that, because that's exactly where I was going. Mm -hmm. But is that godly? Well, that's why I said no. I mean, I, I, like, I no, no. I mean, because that's like eye for an eye. That's not, that's the Old Testament. And you know, back to that, when you were saying people saying right, right off that they forgive people, I really don't think that's that's really and I'm only speaking my opinion that that's really genuine because the hurt is just still there and, and like you said I think it's just what they think that people supposed to say you know mm -hmm. or you supposed to do yeah I, I don't I, I think when they say that early on that is is it's not really genuine yeah and and that there's that is the the desire to do what people expect is strong mm -hmm. and will right. is a strong motivator. But to be honest, they, to sit there and actually say, 
it, it, especially if you caught, you know, this dude was active in his church. His family is probably very church going folks. And you just, it would be like me sitting around there and saying, well, well, I forgive you. I'm going to tell you, if somebody walk in my house and, and I'm not here and take the wife of the life of my wife, you're not getting forgiveness from Pastor Ryan. Or Judy. Not, not right off the bat. <laughs> now, you know, maybe a year from now after God has been working on me, it's a different That's ball. what I'm saying. Yep. Mm-hmm. But, but two months into this thing, three months mm-hmm. into this thing, no, mm-hmm. they, they would still have to keep me in restraints from strangling you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as long as there is rage coursing through my body, there is no way that forgiveness is coexisting with that anger. There is no forgiveness right now for me for this cop. There is still nothing but rage. And the only thing that is quelling the little bit, uh, helping to keep this rage down is the spirit of the holy God. In you is the spirit of the holy God. And my desire to have that spirit dwell in me and to be pleasing to God now, see, the problem that we, we have to wrestle with, hopefully over time, we'll be able to, to understand this more and more. Part, part of this, the reason why we go through these Bible studies is that we begin to, Matt, you know what, Let, let's do this. There is a, let me shift to Proverbs. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5 says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This, the whole thing and point of Bible study is to continue to glean and search through the word of God that we will find understanding and the knowledge of God. Because as we go along and we continue to, to study and feast on these words and grow, then we begin to understand more and more about God. See, when you see, if you remember, there were some some people that we would call the old people, the, the, the old saints, they were some angry folks. The one thing I remember, well, I won't say the one thing. There are a lot of things I remember about Deer, but one of the things I remember that stood out from Deer was one day she was talking to, I don't remember if it was Jean or Andy, and something came up about something that happened and these words that came out of Deer's mouth shocked me because I had never heard such anger. I actually hadn't heard any anger from her, uh, but this particular day she was angry and it was anger at, at something, it was a racial thing that had, had occurred and she let these words out that just blew me away. Um, and, and there are times that those things occur, even for believers. Uh, and I would say my knowledge of dear, would, you would never call her a punk. Uh, and I certainly, if I would have before then, after hearing that anger from that lady, that <laughs> punk is definitely not something that would describe her. But there were people who believed in God and took his word to heart and they weren't punks, they were true to God's word. And consequently, what they had was a level of peace that many of us will never, ever, ever attain. Because we get so caught up in everything that's going on and we respond. When we talk about how the enemy comes in and stirs things up, and I I said this Sunday at church, his goal was, and may have not been this Sunday, but his goal is not necessarily to get you to worship him. It is to get you away from Jesus. And the more he keeps you away from Jesus, the more he can get his hooks in you. And the more you respond like the world and less like God. See, there is a way. Yeah, you said- oh. Go ahead. 
I'm just going to tell you, Pastor, you said the shift of the commitment is never from Christ to evil, but from Christ to self, That's allowing it. self That's desire right. to That's right, right, right. And, and you got to admit this, this rage that we are feeling is while it is probably and undoubtedly a righteous indignation, it still comes about what we want, right. what I want. I want him fired. I want him to go to prison. I want him to die. And if I'm honest, I want his family to suffer. Oh, for Just really? being real. Really? Hmm. Uh, because it, I figure he, whatever poison mm. he has, he has poisoned his family. Mm. And I want them to feel the same pain that Mr. Floyd's family. I'm just being real. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I know I'm, I'm not you. alone. I'm with you. So, You're not by yourself, Pastor. I'm, I'm with you. And I struggle with that. And so when I get to the word of God and I'm preparing the Bible study and I see that, that here's, here's Daniel taken from his land, given a new name. Does this sound vaguely familiar? To, you know, taken from their land, given a new name, mm -hmm. a whole mm -hmm. new culture. Mm -hmm. And yet he's not raging. He's still maintaining his level of faith, his, his commitment to God. And because of his commitment to God, he then is elevated we saw that already in chapter two, that he got promoted, as well as uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. They all got promoted because they remain faithful. Now, I'm not looking for promotion. I'm just looking to maintain a spirit of the holy God within me. And that's what we should be striving to. And Proverbs, those words in Proverbs echo the personality and being of, of, of Daniel having the spirit of God because he had knowledge of God. The reason why he was able to know the dream in chapter two and interpret it. And the reason why he's able to interpret this dream is because he knew God. He had the knowledge and discernment of God and God simply saying, <clears throat> if you want it, chase after me, like you chase after everything else. If you want what I got, <clears throat> While you chasing them dollars, chase after me. While you chasing after these women, chase after me. You chasing after these cars in this house, chase after me and I will give you discernment and I will give you knowledge. Uh oh. Here's the thing about this discernment and knowledge that we'll, we'll get when we chase after God. There's power in knowledge and discernment. And when you have that power, here are these men in chapter two, they were coming to kill the wise men. But it was only because of who Daniel was that they was able to not only not kill them, but save the lives of the other people. Then they turn around and, and sell uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, but they survived the fiery furnace, not because these people love them is because they remain faithful and have power and knowledge and discernment. Jennifer, were you about to say something? I don't know. I don't no. know what's going on. Wow. No. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I just saw that the box went lit up around your, your name. Oh, okay. <laughs> But there is a, Nebuchadnezzar had recognized that there was something about Daniel. The world has to recognize, and I'm not speaking of the entire world, I'm saying the people who are unchurched, unsaved, and even the people who call themselves going to church have to recognize when the spirit of God is in you. Because quite frankly, the, the spirit of God is not in any of these churches that remain silent in the face of this evil that is going on. If, if you cannot speak out against evil, the spirit of God is not in your church. When, when I see churches, 
telling people to just be patient. Uh, just, just, you know, just don't worry about it uh, and have nothing to say. As a matter of fact, there, there are people who are uncomfortable having this discussion. And I keep telling people who are uncomfortable, the reason why you have to continue to have that is because the uncomfortableness will make you grow. If we keep avoiding what makes us uncomfortable, you will never develop. The people who go to the gym once in a while never lose the weight because they don't get uncomfortable. They want to remain comfortable. Verse four, Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. That's what people want to do. I just want to be where I am and be left alone and not be reminded of this evil that's out here. I don't want to know about the bad things that are happening in this world. I don't want to hear you tell me black lives matter because I don't see color. I hate that more than anything else. If you refuse to see my color, then you refuse to see me because my color defines me. It defines you, it defines everybody. It is a descriptor of who we are. Nebuchadnezzar knew the difference between his Babylonian people and the Hebrews. That is why he conquered Judah. He was trying to take them down. He knew they were different from them. We are all different, but that difference does not make us adversaries. And if we find that there is a group of people who have a benefit that another group of people don't, and this group of people get to do whatever they want, and this group of people face a higher scrutiny, then it is your obligation to speak out against the evil that is happening over here. Mm -hmm. And if you fail to do that, that is when we, we see, that he, I guess here's a real life example, I guess I should have used this, is that when you say you want to see the spirit of God in these people, if they are not speaking out against injustice, the spirit of God is not in them. Anybody who is sitting around here talking about we're pro-life, but you don't care nothing about a cop putting his knee in somebody's neck, mm -hmm. then the spirit of God is not in you. You out here protesting with guns, taking over a government office, and nobody does it. Innocent people marching through the street because of you, you have unjust and evil laws and they are met with rubber bullets and tear gas. That's evil. You're trying to quell the voice of people speaking out against evil when they are unarmed, but yet you got nothing to say when a group of white men go and storm a government building carrying semi-automatic weapons. The spirit of God is not in them. Part of what this Bible study also does is reveal the things that you see in this world. And this is something for us to look at when we're watching. See, I, everybody knows me, know that I don't like Joel Osteen. He is not a preacher. He is not a man of God. He is a shyster. He is a charlatan. He's a con man. Every time people tell I like him because he only speaks about the positive. Well, life is not always pretty and positive. Mm -hmm. There's an ugly side to life. There is an ugly side to every human being, the evil that, that exists, the anger that exists inside of all of us. There's something ugly in all of us. The human heart, uh, the word said, who, the, the human heart is of evil above all else. Who can comprehend? And you just want to sit up and smile and tell everybody everything's all right. Everything can go be all right, bro. And if you were certainly too afraid to confront evil when evil is in your face, then you are not a man of God. And if you as a Christian are not willing to confront evil or willing to get in the fight and get uncomfortable when dealing with evil, then you are not a Christian. I will say it to their face. There is a Ephesians, Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter five, verse 11. Ephesians five, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfaithful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. 
The worst part of all this is that we have people doing these evil deeds in public. Not more than was two weeks ago, Ahmad uh, Arbery was hunted down and shot in the street. Two weeks later, this man pulled from his, violently pulled from his car. They said he was resisting arrest. They show, and now they got uh, surveillance video from other cameras that he was not resisting. He was handcuffed and sitting on the curb. And next thing you know, you see him on, in the street with a knee in his neck with the cop talking about just get in the car, just get in the car. As if, if he tried to get up, what would happen to him? How could he get in the car anyway? He got they the darn knee. You got your knee, which with right. his hands in his pockets. Right. Just get in the car. Mm -hmm. Just get in the car. And I guess the people, that's kind of bothered me. The people around there, they were saying, you know, he can't breathe, he can't breathe. I, I just wonder, there is nothing that anybody couldn't have done to make that cop get up off, off of you? Well, see, here's the thing. You, you know, uh, remember when you have these people who, who exist now that it's a, a good thing I wasn't around in slave times. Good thing mm -hmm. I wasn't around during the civil rights movement. No, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have done anything. Don't, <laughs> the, the same people that will stand around videotaping are the same ones mm -hmm. that will talk about how they, good thing I wouldn't run around. I wouldn't have stood for that. Everybody want to be a beast until it's time to be a beast. When it's time to get down and dirty, everybody runs and tuck tails, tuck tail and run away. Everybody ain't called to be a tiger or a lion. We got a bunch of lambs talking, but when it comes time to actually do something, to intervene, to stand up, they go turn tail and run. David wrote in Psalm, Psalm 94, verse 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Here again is something else that's the spirit of God. I mean, he's saying, who's going to stand up against the evildoers? There's a colleague of mine who uh, raised some money. He's flying to Minneapolis tonight, probably seen him on TV, uh, Naji Ali, to help uh, organize these people and uh, get them to demand the, that not only the, these guys be uh, tried, but they be arrested for what they did. Not everybody's willing to do that. See, here's the fundamental question when we start talking about the spirit of God as, as we do dwell, delve further into this. What are you willing to risk to raise up against evil? How much, how much of your personal comfort are you willing to put on the line to stand up against the workers of iniquity? You see, the question and the criticism levied against Christians come from those who talk about Christians as being passive and all you do is pray, but you never see those people out on the front line anywhere. They're not giving up anything. Or you'll never see me on my knees. And I don't ever see, yeah, I don't see you on your knees and I don't see you fighting for anybody either. I see you talking. I hear you talking more than I hear anything else. But you have never rose up against the evildoers. Or as Paul said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful work, workers of darkness. And even in Isaiah, telling us to learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. That is the spirit of God. And even when we read the story of Daniel, he's in captivity, but obviously Nebuchadnezzar saw something in him 
that said he belonged to the Most High God. So much so that at the very beginning up here, Nebuchadnezzar is singing the grace, the greatness of our God. And I'd be willing to bet is not because Daniel was a punk, but probably more of a warrior like David. <clears throat> no comments. Um, I didn't have one. I think that was just, you know, what you said. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Mm -mm -mm. I agree, but I do have a comment too. Go for it. It's very unsettling with the stuff that's happening to black people. And one of the girls at work said something when the other gentleman, when Aubrey was shot, um, she said, and I know she's a Christian from what, you know, my interactions with her. But she said, why is God letting us continue to suffer? Was slavery not enough? Why do we have to continue to go through this? Why, why are we so hated, so feared, so envied? Why? You know, the um, interesting point to that, because that, that's a question that I've heard, it's a question that I've asked, why does this stuff continue to happen? I would, I would say, just my personal opinion, that uh, why what we're going through or what we see continue to happen is more of a result of us looking to be a part of this world instead of being who we are collectively. You know, we're, we're, we keep chasing after wanting the world to accept us. It's, it's like... Uh, my friend said today, who's going to be on behind the pulpit on Friday, he was likening our experience to some a fish tank. That if you have a freshwater tank and you put your freshwater fish in there, there they'll thrive because that's made for them. But then if you introduce saltwater fish to a freshwater tank, they won't respond the same way the environment is not suited for them. The, the conditions mm -hmm. are made for the freshwater fish and not for the saltwater fish. So when you put them in here, we, they, the question most people ask, like they ask, what is wrong with you? Why can't you fit in here? Instead of questioning, what's wrong with this environment? See, there is a fundamental problem with America that people don't wanna deal with. There has been a fundamental problem from the very beginning of, of, of when those pilgrims came here and, and as Malcolm X said, Plymouth, they didn't land on uh, Plymouth, what he, how did he say that? We didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. Mm -hmm. They got here and they systematically tried to destroy the indigenous people of this land. Then they bring over and institute a system of chattel slavery. Uh, and after they go through that, we go through the whole uh, Jim Crow and uh, Reconstruction, Jim Crow and segregation. This entire history of this land has been built on blood, hatred, and evil. And it's not going to change at any time. It is a sad reality. And I said this on social media that the pandemic that we need to fear is not COVID. It is the pandemic of hate and evil that has permeated and courses through the very veins of this nation from the beginning of time. Its foundation was built on hatred and evil. And it continues to this day. Mm, yeah. And Can the problem see? with that mm. is that until until people speak out in a loud voice, a loud collective voice against this evil, instead of trying to get your piece of the pie, it is always going to be this way. And the only time it's going to change 
But the problem is it, it was going to make it hard to change is what we're seeing that's existing right now in this government is that the census will tell you that as a group, white people, Caucasian people are becoming, are less and less the majority. So the only thing you can do uh, that, that, or what we're seeing is that make America great again, not for the purposes of prospering the nation, but to maintain power for this small select group of people that continuing, that continues to shrink and further disenfranchise the majority of the people who happen to be people of color. Unless the people of color come together and you first and foremost acknowledge God. We, we, that Bible verse is 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal, forgive them of their sins and heal their land. We have been chasing after the so-called American dream. That's what they call it. We keep chasing after this thing that was not meant for us. And the more we pursue it, the more it's, you think about this, the, the whole mantra of this nation is to pull yourself, yourself up by your bootstraps. There is nothing about working together. Oh, the preamble of the Constitution is great because it, it talks about this vision and a dream, but the fact of the matter, the practical application is the individual. And so individually, we, are, we cannot succeed and thrive individually. And the more we buy into this idea of the American dream and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, which we have bought in for centuries, and we've gotten nowhere with it because it does not apply for us. The only way things will change is if we collectively abandon this idea of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and say, we're pulling us up together. But we got to pull it up together with God. Otherwise, it's a fruitless effort. Makes sense. Thank you, Pastor. Because God is always the, the one question that people say, why does God keep allowing this to happen? And the question that God could ask us right back, why do you keep allowing it to happen? Hmm. There are things that we see right now that as we can say within our community that we can fix, but we don't want to because it's going to be an infringement on my lifestyle. I don't want these people in my house. They need to go get a job. I did it. Why can't you? Hmm. And consequently, we abandon these people. What are we doing for all these kids of you that, that, that need fathers? If you're not part of a group that mentors young men, you mentors young women to teach them about uh, uh, clean hygiene and respecting themselves and not allow themselves to be used and abused by men on the street, whether it's a man or a boy, and help them study. That's the, was so important for us to give out of scholarships, to award these students and give them an opportunity to make college easier and available to them. But every church is not doing that. Our little church just give out five scholarships Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. five $1,000 scholarships. I guarantee you there are churches that are pulling in 80 grand a week that ain't giving out one scholarship this year <laughs> or in the last 10 years. Okay. But, and then we have the, the audacity to question, why are we failing? Why is this still happening? We ain't doing nothing about it. And because you go out in the street and protest and get mad, that ain't doing nothing about it. We know what the problems are. So are you willing to fix these things? And if you're not, then you might as well shut up. We're I willing tell people to, that all the time. Huh? Yeah. I, think, I think we're willing to, but as a people, we just, it's just, I, I just don't have, 
I just don't see it coming together because there's a lot of there's a lot of us that you know Christians or whoever that believes this and want it to happen. But you know, what do you do? I mean, I know it's a little bitty group. You can do big things or, or whatever, but it's just it's kind of disheartening because people, our people, always leaning on the fact you know of the white what the white man did to me so like we owe it like they owe us something and they just stick to that mentality so what do we do as as a body of church you know it's the same thing what do we do until they all come together collectively what can you do well we got to do something because if we don't do anything then we'll just be sitting here 30 40 years from now talking about the same, the same thing right so what do we do that's got to start somewhere somebody's got to do something it's almost like we're waiting on on martin or malcolm to come back yeah and it it's, just it's, might it's, it may not be martin and malcolm maybe it'd be judy and gwen come on gwen i got you <laughs> that's right that's right i'm right behind you gwen with my stick i got you oh, it could be jennifer hold on <laughs> well, yeah, it's, but it's going to take work. It is, mm -hmm. and but that, I think we're willing to do it. You know, we just have to have the right, the right, um, not format. Well, it's it just has to be done in a in a way that we can attract other people and get them as you know in, invested in it as we would be. You know, right? People with the right attitude. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 dedicated to that, you know. And that can follow and not have to be in charge. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, he, he yep. Here's that thing, like Nebuchadnezzar said, he saw the spirit of God in Daniel. Mm -hmm. People, there was a reason why Malcolm was attractive. There was a reason why Martin was attractive to people. There was something that emanated from inside that people were willing to get behind. And it wasn't because they were outside ready to, to burn down a building. They both wanted justice. They just had a different means to go about getting it. So mm. let's go pray us out. I will. Go for it. Father God. I personally say thank you. I say thank you for this hour, Father God, of studying your word. Father God, I thank you for our Pastor Ron who pushes forward, Father God, with energy and desire to honor you, Father God, to share with his people, Father God, to share with your people, to teach us, Father God, to keep us grounded and rooted in your word, Father God, to keep us going strong and to be mindful, Father God, that only what we do for you will last. Nothing else really matters, Father God. So even when we doubt, Father God, when we're unsure, Father God, we must look to you. We must open your book, Father God, and read your word so that we can remind ourselves, Father God, that it is always about you. You are still in control. Father God, this world is in your hands in spite of what we see, in spite of what we hear, Father God, you still exist and you are still in charge, Father God. And we must surrender all to you, Father God, in order to see your results. So we love you, Father God, and I pray for everyone who was on Bible study tonight. I ask that you touch them individually, touch their homes, Father God, their families. Just reach out, Father God, and cover us with forgiveness, with love, Father God. Continue to heal our bodies. Help us, Father God, to be strong when we are weak and to be mindful, Father God, of your commandments, to love each other as you have loved us, Father God. I thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer. And I ask that you just continue to bless us through the night, Lord. This prayer is in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.